everyone. My name is Kath, and I am a Canadian, and I'm proud to be one, and I'm proud to represent my nation sometimes. But I'm never, ever ashamed to represent the kingdom of God uh, because I am a new creation because of the one who calls me to represent him. It's an awesome responsibility. One of my favorite Bible verses is 2 Corinthians 5.17, and it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. I've got a question to ask you before we get too far in this. Whose kingdom are you representing? And how do you see the people that your king or the kingdom has asked you to represent that kingdom to? So 2 Corinthians 5.17, a lot of Christians know this verse because it talks about our new identity in Christ Jesus. But I want to emphasize the word our. This word, when you read it in its full context, is not a verse to take out of context all by itself. It's speaking of so much more. And so here's the rest of the story. Now, 2 Corinthians is a follow-up letter to the Corinthians after the first letter that Paul sent them where he had to present some pretty hard truths. And there were a lot of bruised egos and resentment that grew at that point. And so Paul wants to bring reconciliation to the Corinthian church. And he implores with them saying that it's the love of Christ in him and his own love that compels him to reach out to, to them. And he doesn't back down on the things that he said, but he reminds them that, yes, indeed, they are new creations in Christ, but only by what Jesus did for them and not through anything that they did. Now, why is he saying this in this passage from about 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21? Because the Corinthians were seeing other people through lenses of judgmental attitudes that they had towards others. They maybe were seeing fellow Christians from how they were before they were saved, for example. Or perhaps they were seeing other people who weren't in through um, judgmental eyes of, oh, well, these people are all like that. So there was a prejudicial sort of attitude that was in the Corinthian church too. We're better than you are kind of thing. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians. But let's get back to Paul. Paul understood what it was like to wear lenses that made him see the world much differently than how it really was. And so much so that Paul was kind of the chief prosecutor or um, bounty hound hunter for his fellow Pharisees. He carried around paperwork that gave him the right to sign execution papers over Christians. So this guy on the road to Damascus where he was off to do his thing, he stopped in his tracks. He is knocked off his high horse. It knocks some sense into him, and he meets Jesus, the one who he was persecuting, all in the name of judicial law and keeping everything right. And get this, later on, Paul will be called to be an ambassador for the one he persecuted in his past, but not to his fellow Jews, no, to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles were the people that people of Paul's uh, religious affiliation, the 
Pharisees would have nothing to do with outside of business transactions. They would never go to their homes, never less talk with them about God. And here God calls him as an ambassador. So Paul points out that the way that the Corinthian churches saw others needs to change because they've met Christ and we can apply that as Christians today. I love how Paul says about his experience on the D Damascus Road uh, in Acts 9 is where that takes place, but he's talking about it to the C Corinthian church. This is from the message translation, 2 Corinthians 5.16. We don't evaluate people we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that one and we got it all wrong, you know? We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Paul's religious and cultural assumptions had to die before he was going to be able to do the task that God set on him. And so the only credentials that uh, Paul now carried until his last days on earth were faith, love, and humility, all fueled by the revelation of Jesus Christ that he experienced on his D Damascus road. And humility, he had to lay down all the assumptions that he held against the Gentiles because he was called to minister to them. So what is an ambassador anyhow? Uh, in the simplest of terms, uh, ambassador is the official mouthpiece of a nation. And he is sent to another nation in order to speak the words from the leaders of his home country. But it's a little bit different as Christians. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. So it's as we as Christ's ambassadors are there not to try to get people to do something for our God, but instead we are to reconcile them and invite them to see the God who can do so much for them that no one else could ever do. When I was in Youth with, with a Mission, I had plenty of opportunities. Uh, by the way, YWAM is an international missionary organization I worked with for 14 years. So I quite often had to get visas renewed and that kind of thing. And I hated going to the consulate. And that isn't even as big as the embassies. But in the consulate, consulates, you were greeted with red tape. You felt uh, impersonal. You felt that all around you was imposing. And most of all, you felt that if you said anything wrong, if you didn't answer a question perfectly correctly, you were being judged and scrutinized. And you might get into trouble in the country that you are trying to get the visa re renewed at. And embassy is one step up from that. Now, the common folk usually don't go to the embassies that much. Uh, but when they do, they're met with the same sort of thing. Uh, but an embassy is where the ambassador, the chief top representative of another n nation does their business that's where you were usually, unless you're somebody really important, you would never see an ambassador. Because whatever an ambassador speaks is taken by other nations as the official word of the leader of their home country. And so they speak with much care and they're careful as to who they speak to. They have one primary mission, to make sure that the intentions of their nation are well represented and well understood to the bigwigs. 
we as Christ's ambassadors of reconciliation are a little bit like ambassadors on the earth, but we represent the intentions of a kingdom that's totally different than any kingdom on the earth. The ruler of our upside down kingdom calls us to speak his words of reconciliation to people and countries who don't even know they need to be reconciled. His terms are gloriously, ridiculously generous. Just listen to this. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 21. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses, fancy words for counting their sins against them, and has committed to us, his ambassadors, the word of reconciliation, which is this in verse 21. He who, for he, God, made Jesus, him, though for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us on the cross that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Unlike earthly ambassadors, therefore, we are not meant to spend most of our time in the nice, secure walls of our embassies, sometimes known as churches, home groups, uh, Christian cliques, whatever you want to call it. No, the words we are carrying are not just meant for the ears of the movers and shakers of the world, nor are they meant for people who are already reconciled to, to Christ. We are called to step out of the door into the highways and the byways. We are living testaments of the kingdom that we represent, and the credentials that we carry are written on our hearts. But the only way that people are going to see what is in our heart is through our actions and through our words. We are God's ambassadors everywhere we go. We're, not, we're never off the clock at any point. Anywhere we, rep we interact with other human beings, in person or over the internet, we are called to be his ambassadors and therefore our words and actions hold a greater weight than we would really like it to carry. But what an opportunity that we have to take God's offer of reconciliation to a increasingly splintered and divisive world. We can bring hope. So let's pick up our credentials of faith and love and hope and humility. That's a big one because they're all going to be fueled by the revelation each of us have personally experienced when we came face to face with the life-changing heart of Jesus Christ. We need reconciliation with God's heart sometimes even if we've been walking with the Lord for many years. Perhaps if you listen today, you realize that there's some areas in your heart and in your lives that need to line up with God's truth about the people who you see every day. So maybe you're only seeing someone through the lens of the eyes of um, what they once were, and they've changed, and God's made them into a new creation, but you can't let go of seeing them from their past. Or perhaps there's people who have not yet come into reconciliation with Christ in your life, and you have made judgments against them because of the lens that you see them, the filters that you have created, the, the assumptions and the prejudices you might have towards them uh, simply because of who they are or what they represent. So what can you do about that? Take those lenses to God and come to him and ask him in all humility for him to replace those dirty lenses with his holy contact lenses. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you that we are no longer who we once were, but that's only through your transforming grace and mercy. We thank you for the tremendous privilege as your ambassadors to bring good news of your ridiculously generous offer of reconciliation to a world that is desperate for hope and desperate for the notion that they can be reconciled with people who they might even disagree with. Give us new lens to see your world, your people, your loved ones, Lord, the way that you see them. In Jesus' name, amen.